Der Plan war Ziffern. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Convocation. Uh, we have three short announcements while you're settling in. So, uh, Brad Schmidt. Hey, good morning. All right, so last call to get your meal tickets for Saturday, October 12. Uh, I will be outside the calf today from noon to 1, so grab your meal tickets. You need them, you need them, you need them. Also, Student Alumni Association is planning some fun events for everyone for Saturday. Uh, look for details on one of those events later in the week, and Sarah is going to tell you about the other one now. Okay, so you guys should have received an email from Brad, a Google form where you can nominate a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, a coach, and a faculty member, and you're gonna nominate them for a pie eating contest. Basically what we've got is a whipped cream pie, and they're gonna search with their faces, no hands, finding 10 gummy bears in that whipped cream. So if you wanna get a coach back for making you run all those sprints, or a teacher back for making you write tons of papers, please, please vote. Thanks. I love you, Sarah. I love you too. Hey, it's Ryan. I'm the student athlete leadership team president, and SALT is starting a monthly um, Bethel employee recognition. So how it's going to work is that at our SALT meetings once a month, we're going to nominate a Bethel employee for several employees, and then we're going to send a survey out to you guys, the students, for you to vote on. Um, this employee will be recognized by the athletic department. So if you want to nominate someone, talk to your SALT representative, and be sure to vote on the survey that's going to be coming to your emails. Thank you. Can you put the Dominican Republic slide, please? So we're gonna continue highlighting Hispanic countries for diversity council. So Dominican Republic is the only country in the world that has an image of the Holy Bible on its flag. 
It is the second largest island in the Caribbean. Um, Pico Duarte is 3,098 meters, is the highest point in the country. Um, lake Enriquillo is the largest lake in the lowest elevation of the Caribbean. Thank you. This morning, we're going to hear from Dr. Mark Jansen. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, hear from Mark. Many of you know Mark Jansen already. He has been a professor of history at Bethel College for going on 19 years now. Uh, and many of you have had the opportunity to learn from Mark about the Cold War in the classroom. What you may or may not already know is that Mark Jansen was a witness, an eyewitness and a participant in this historical time period, specifically the fall of the Berlin Wall. I will turn it over to Mark. He's gonna share with us about his experiences as a student and participant in this historic event. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you, it's great to be here and I'm glad to have this chance to share some of my experiences and memories with you. Uh, today is the 70th birthday uh, of East Germany, uh, but it didn't make it because uh, we sort of killed it off around the 40th birthday, um, and that's what we're going to talk about. But the very last song you heard when you came in was the national anthem of East Germany, a country that no longer exists. Um, now, so we have to go back in time, what was going on uh, 30 years ago. We even go back to the time uh, when I was a student here at Bethel and attending Convo, and some of the older people might remember maps like this uh, or something like this. Uh, so this is, a, this is what will happen if a Soviet 50 megaton hydrogen bomb were exploded over Newton. Um, and you can see, uh, so the green, this is the radiation, you'd be immediately dead. Uh, the next circle out is a fireball, uh, that would get you. Uh, the red circle is um, where the blast would hit 20 PSI, and so every building would be uh, knocked down. Um, this circle is the blast that's 10 PSI, uh, so any, any wood structure in that circle is going to be gone. Um, uh, and this, this further one out, uh, that's all the glass. So imagine any glass window in this circle, it's all knocked out. Um, and then uh, the, the, the one that goes out the furthest here, this circle, um, that's where if you're standing outside and you have exposed skin when this thing goes off, you have a 100% chance of third degree burns. So you can go ask a nurse what third degree burns are like. Um, and if you think there's a hospital that's gonna treat you after all of this, you're out of luck. Um, so we all grew up with these maps in our head all the time because this could have happened uh, 30 minutes from now. So if something would have gone down during Convo, you know, this could have happened in the, between, in the time of Convo, that those missiles could have gotten uh, from the Soviet Union to here. Now nobody's going to target Newton, Kansas, because there's nothing here. Um, <laughs> so yay for us, we're safe. Um, I grew up uh, close to Beatrice, Nebraska. Uh, about 100 miles from Offutt Air Force Base, which probably most people have never heard of, uh, but it, it, it was the headquarters of Strategic Air Command. And Strategic Air Command was in charge of all of our nuclear bombers as well as all of our nuclear missiles. So Offutt Air Force Base was without doubt the top military target of the Soviet Union. Um, and so this map, uh, you know, I saw imposed over Offutt Air Force Base and the circles uh, didn't quite get to me uh, there's another map, I couldn't find it, uh, but another way to think about this map is where is the wind blowing, where is the radiation fallout, uh, and I grew up in that band where we'd probably die uh, three months after the blast went off of radiation exposure. So what are you going to do with those three months? I don't know. Um, so this is how I grew up, you know, I came to Bethel, and this is in the back of people's minds. Uh, some people, you know, most people didn't worry about this, some people are like, hmm, uh, you know, what are we going to do about this? Really, what can you do about a problem that is that big? Uh, it's hard to say. The United States spent 22 trillion of today's dollars on the Cold War. 
so obviously our government is spending a lot of resources on this that is about the equivalent of our national debt today so just to give you this idea of the size and scale and scope of this problem um, well yeah so this was the thinking there um, when I was a student I, I thought about it some um, but really what can you do about a problem that is that big I don't know um, some people would say well some people who are Christians might say well is there a Christian response to this uh, that's a big question Again, I don't know you have to sort that out some people would even say and um, this is a shout out for all the Biffle students all the seniors uh, your book uh, to, this year is going to ask you to think about these words of Jesus. Uh, I tell you not to resist the evil one, but if someone strikes you on the right cheek, to turn to him the other cheek also. Uh, and a little further on, it says, uh, Jesus says, uh, you should love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Is that possible? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but it seemed to me so here's a whole bunch, there's a whole society over there, Soviet Union, that's trying to kill us, and we're geared, geared up to kill them. We could do the same thing, you know, to Moscow or uh, any city uh, in the east. What does this mean? What is going on? I have no idea. This is complicated. But, well, at the very least, uh, I could go visit. So a few years after I graduated Bethel, uh, I applied to a program run by Mennonite Central Committee, which has an office just north of the football stadium now, uh, and they were sending people to uh, East Bloc countries as students. The only way you could get into these countries was as a student, uh, not the Soviet Union, but these other East Bloc countries. So I was a, I said, I want to go, I'll be a student, I just want to see what's going on there, I don't really care what I study. Uh, and they said, well, the only visa we can get you in Berlin is to study theology. I'm like, fine, whatever, I'll study theology. <laughs> Why not? Uh, so this is, this is what the map used to look like. You can see uh, East Germany, West Germany. Um, and this, this border was pretty well sealed off in the 40s already, um, uh, as was the border from, and West Berlin here was attached to West Germany. So you, you couldn't really, you could take a train, um, you could fly. If you went on the road, you know, there was special regulations for that. Uh, but West Berlin is part of West Germany, uh, and its border is sealed off already also in the 40s. Uh, but the, in the city, between East and West Berlin, this border was open until 1961. And in 1961, just on the night of uh, August 11, going into August 12, they just spread soldiers everywhere and barbed wire everywhere, and then they started building a wall. Uh, so in, from 61 on, there's a wall about 100 miles long that snaked its way through the middle of this city. Uh, and so I'm going to East Berlin on the communist side. Uh, there's a half a million Soviet soldiers in East Berlin. Um, and, you know, that's where I'm going to go and that's where I'm going to be uh, for three years. Hmm. Do I have to point this at something in particular to get it to work? Could you just advance the next slide? Ah, it blew up the machine. <coughs> well, it's... Yeah, you keep playing with that thing? It's not working. Ah, well, while you're rebooting it, uh, I'll tell you what you're going to see. So I have a picture of the wall uh, that we'll look at. Uh, We'll, we'll, you, so you can see what the wall looks like. Um, but I'm, I'm entering a whole different culture. Uh, the culture is really different. So I have a picture of the wall. They'll get to that eventually. I also have a picture of some of the products. So you have to imagine uh, there's no Western products of any kind. No Coca-Cola, no Pepsi-Cola, no fast food restaurants. Uh, nothing that you're wearing now could you ever find in any store in East Germany. Uh, nothing that you've bought uh, probably in your entire life would you ever find in an East German store. They had entirely all of their own products, entirely different culture. That's why old people make a big deal about globalization, because uh, here's a whole half of the world that was completely separate consumer culture. 
uh, and their goals were to provide food and shelter for everyone uh, and not much else. And they kind of managed that. They didn't have homelessness. They had really cheap bread. Uh, but quality of goods, you know, that was not, the, not so much uh, their interest. So let's see. Here we go. Hey, now we're back in business. So here you can see the wall. So this is on the west side. I could, it was a long story. I could get to the west on occasion. So I'm in West Berlin. Uh, for those of you who know West Berlin, I'm standing with my, I got my back up against the parliament, the federal parliament building, their Reichstag, uh, which was not operational during the Cold War um, because it was in West Berlin. So the West German capital's in Bonn and they're meeting over there. It's just a museum. And you can see, so here's the, here's the Berlin Wall. Here's the guard tower. There's a little guard guy up there. Uh, with his gun and his spotlight. Uh, and if you go through this wall, there's a, just a big empty strip of land and another wall on the other side. So it's a, you know, if you want to get out, it's a real obstacle course. You've got to get over one wall. You've got the guys with the guns. You've got to get over this wall. And you can see here on the west side of the wall, they put up wood crosses with names. Uh, about 140 people were killed uh, trying to cross this wall while it was up. So 140 people is not a lot. Uh, really, but the symbolism of it is quite something. Uh, and people really wanted to get out. And when I was there in February, I got there in September of 1988. In February of 1989, um, a guy in Berlin was killed trying to get across this wall. His name was Chris Jeffroy. Um, and he was actually an acquaintance of a friend of mine. So even though Berlin, East Berlin was a city of a million people, uh, you know, this wall is very, very personal uh, to people who live there. You just, yeah, can't, can't really cross it. Uh, so here are some of our uh, awesome consumer goods. Uh, anybody guess what's in? So the butter, right, you'll figure out. You know, you know what this sack is? Sack of what? A sack of milk. Yeah, you bought your milk in sacks. They just put it in a plastic bag, and then you had to put the plastic bag in the pitcher, and you'd cut a little corner off, and then you'd pour your milk out of the plastic bag. Uh, if that's the only way you're going to buy milk, that's how you'll buy milk. So this is a sense of what it means to so milk is cheap. Everybody's got milk. It comes in a stupid plastic bag. <laughs> you got to carry it home. If it starts leaking, that's your problem. It leaks all over the stores. It's a mess. Um, so here, you know, here's another. This was staged probably afterwards. I found this on the internet. Uh, but you can see why well, you can buy peas. You can buy lentils. You can buy spaghetti. Uh, you can buy here's a, uh, I don't know. We don't even have that here. You know, you got uh, powdered milk. You got rice. Does the brand matter? No. It's only one brand. The price is printed on the packaging because it hasn't changed in decades. Um, that's your selection. You want a different kind of rice? Too bad. The whole country's only got one kind of rice, one kind of lentils, one kind of peas, one kind of everything. It's cheap. It's available. Hmm, I don't know. So uh, anyway, I got there. Oh, wow. Oh, there we go. Oops. Now it's gone. Uh, so I met, I met the students. I was with a group of students. There were 25 of us admitted that year to study Protestant theology at Humboldt University. We took most of our classes together. So I got to know those students well. I want you to pay particular attention to this young woman. Her name was Bearable Troy. Uh, and we were all taking Latin together. So Troy in German means faithful or loyal. And we learned that word in Latin. The word, Latin word for that is fidos. So her last name, you know, literally, would be Faithful. So we just called her Fidos. So this is her nickname. So this is Fidos. She's a good friend of mine. Still in touch with her. Um, she had uh, kind of the unusual status of being able to travel, like once. Uh, so she got to know a guy in the West, and then she came back. Uh, so she's studying Protestant theology in East Berlin. Her boyfriend, Olaf is studying Protestant theology in West Berlin. They're in the same city, two different countries. She can never go see him. So if you're in a relationship and you're female, I want you to imagine that you're in the East. You can no go, never go visit your boyfriend, ever. You're in the same city. If you're a boy in your relationship, imagine, wow, you're in a city with all these other girls. You can do whatever you want, but your girlfriend's over in the East. You can't call her. Phone lines don't really work very well. You could write her a letter. If you want to go see her, you can. You have to pay $15 for a one-day visa. So you can go visit her whenever you want. You probably have to arrange meetings by writing letters. Uh, she can never come visit you. It's an, I, it's an interesting dating relationship. 
Uh, well, I told you there's a half a million uh, Soviet soldiers uh, in East Germany. I don't know if anybody recognizes this handsome devil. You recognize that guy? <laughs> Vladimir Putin, president of Russia, uh, he was stationed in Dresden with the KGB the same time that I was uh, in uh, so Dresden, uh, down to the south of Berlin. He's there as a KGB agent. Uh, this is his pass to get into East German secret police. They're called the Stasi. So this is his Stasi pass. He can get into East German secret police offices, which makes sense because he's working for the KGB. Uh, when East Germany collapses, uh, there's a point in December where the protesters I'm going to tell you about show up outside of Vladimir Putin's office. Right next door, well, in, in the same day, in the same part of the town, they've closed down the East German secret police by storming that office, uh, just occupying it. That happens after the stories I'm going to tell you. They also go to Vladimir Putin's office. He goes out front and says, I have my gun. I will shoot you. Don't come into my office. All the guys in there have guns. Uh, so the demonstrators say, well, fine. You know, they're the KGB. You're going to be gone anyway. So they don't go in there. Later, we find out Vladimir Putin called the Russian tank commander closest to his building and said, I need tanks. Send me tanks. And the tank commander told him, we cannot send tanks without explicit orders from Moscow, and Moscow is silent. They're not answering the phone. Vladimir Putin, to this day, fears demonstrators more than anything else because of what happened in East Germany while he was there. So when you see Vladimir Putin responding to demonstrations in Ukraine, in Georgia, or in Moscow, this is in his head. We are in his head. Uh, so that's an impact uh, from them that still kind of sticks around. Well, the KGB is there, uh, East German secret police. So uh, you can see this is a letter I got. It's addressed to me. Uh, came out of West Germany from Hamburg. Um, it was dated uh, 1988. You can't read the postmark, but I'll, I'll tell you that's what it is. If you look at the date down here, you can see there's a stamp on here from 2012. Why is there a stamp on my letter from 1988 and 2012? The answer is this envelope uh, and this letter were sent to me from secret police archives. So I wrote the secret police. I said, hey, do you guys ever have any records on me? Uh, and we've gone back and forth over the years. And in 2012, they said, hey, we found these letters. Uh, so I was getting letters. Uh, and the secret police were opening them, making photocopies, putting them in a file, closing them back up, and sending them to me. And my letters would say, oh, uh, you know, sorry, damaged in transit, uh, or whatever. I'm like, yes, right, good, thank you. So <laughs> they were reading my letters. I was writing my girlfriend at the time. She's sitting in the, in the audience now. I married her. Hi, Alice. I don't know. Were they reading our letters? Probably. Uh, I lived in a dormitory with one pay phone. Um, and so people could call on that pay phone. It was a dormitory only for theology students. All of the theology students didn't like the phone in us. Uh, so when somebody would call on that, you'd just yell down, you'd yell through the whole stairwell, you know, for whoever's phone it was. One of my friends would answer every phone call by saying, thanks for listening. And we just assumed that the secret police are listening into this phone because it's connected to all these theologians, Christians who probably are not that enthused with communism. So this is what happened on May 1st, uh, 1989. May Day Parade, that's their Labor Day, uh, commemorates uh, workers actually in Chicago. And everybody gets a red flag, and they all march. And you can see they put the flag of the country and a red flag for communism up. Uh, there's a big parade. This is May 1st. Uh, also in May, there are changes happening. So in May in Hungary, while we're celebrating our great communist state, in the communist state of Hungary, the communist party there is introducing reforms. Uh, and they even open up the Iron Curtain. So if you're, and, the, and Hungarians are allowed to go out. Now, nobody wants Hungarians, so they can't really get visas anywhere. They don't leave much. But East Germans, if they can get to West Germany, get immediate citizenship. East Germans are considered West German citizens. So if you can get from here to Hungary, 
you can then go to Austria, because now the border's open. Then you can go uh, to West Germany, get your West German citizenship, and then if you want, you could go to university in West Berlin. And I have a friend who did this in the summer of 1989. Wrote us a postcard later. Sorry, I won't be there for fall semester. You know, the, I was, it was just too good of opportunity in Hungary. Uh, and he transferred to the University of West Berlin, which was like three miles away, but he had to go through all this rigmarole and about a 3,000 mile trip, change countries, and know that he would never see his parents again because they would never let him in or him out. So that would kind of cut down on transfers, but you know, that's what that guy did. Now we get to June. Two things happened in June of 1989. Uh, one was that in Poland they were allowed, also a communist country, to hold almost free elections, and the communists were badly defeated uh, and eventually Poland got a non-communist government, which is unthinkable. So Gorbachev in the Soviet Union is making changes. The same weekend that the Poles are going to elections, uh, this is going down in China. So this is an image known as Tank Man. This is the day, so this is from June 5. Why are there tanks here? Because on June 4, protesters in Tiananmen Square in China protesting for change and democracy and liberty are run down by tanks. The Chinese government is still communist. It won't give us any figures. We can't get to the archives. Uh, but somewhere around 3,000 students uh, and other uh, demonstrators killed is, a, I think, a fairly reliable estimate. This guy's just like, stop. So tanks stop for a while. Then he wanders off, and then they keep rolling. Uh, so Chinese communists are mowing down people. In Poland, they're letting, the communists are letting them vote. Um, now, all of that change got people thinking, well, maybe things could change in East Germany. Uh, how do we do this? What do we do about that? And as it turns out, the German Protestant church has experience historically, if you think about it, living under dictatorships. They lived under the Nazis. Now, most German Protestants were enthusiastic supporters of the Nazis. Uh, most did not care about Jews at all but there was a small group known as a confessing church that got really agitated when the Nazis said, we don't care if your grandparents were Jews uh, or, or Christian, um, but if you convert and be Christian now, we're still going to count you as a Jew. So when the Nazis went after Protestant Christians with Jewish grandparents or Jewish background, or even if they had converted, a few church people said, no, being Christian is more important than your racial background. And that got them into conflict with the Nazis. One of their main leaders was a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Some people know that name. Um, Bonhoeffer actually went to prison, was killed, maybe for some un for related issues. Um, but the confessing church would get together and hold prayer services and pray for people who'd been arrested for resisting the Nazis. And a lot of the people I studied with in theology their parents or grandparents knew these people. This is a living memory. So what do we do? Let's get together and hold a prayer service. Uh, there are big prayer services down in Leipzig. The ones in Berlin were never that big, but these are the ones I went to and had pictures of. So in Leipzig, people are getting together at a prayer service every Monday night to pray for peace. They're naming political prisoners, praying for them, and then they go home. Uh, and things, the group was getting bigger and bigger in Leipzig. Things were getting more and more tense. People were getting arrested for going to these services. And so in October, uh, this church, the Gethsemane Church, started uh, prayer services every night. Uh, they put up banners. That's probably not really legal. They're like, you know, we're going we're gonna to pray and fast for peace. Uh, and Fidos knew about this because she's connected to theology. Her dad was an important leader, uh, regional leader. So she said, hey, Mark, they're doing these prayer services. Because there's, like, there's no publicity. It's all word of mouth. Censored media, no way to find out. She says, hey, there's this prayer service. Let's go. So I went the first night uh, and heard about these things. Um, and then uh, I started going back. So this, this was every night from October 1 to October 10. I didn't go every night. You know, life is busy as a student. Uh, but these turned out to be the only places that people could meet and talk about these things. Now... This started on October 1st. I went for the first time on October 4th. October 7, today, uh, is the birthday of East Germany. So October 7 was the 40th anniversary. And they decked the place out. This is my university, Humboldt University, the main building. You can see they put flags up for the free German youth. Uh, 
communist youth organization, I bought their shirt. So my little flag here matches their little flag up there. And if you were all good East German students, you'd all be wearing this shirt today because it's the anniversary uh, of the founding of our country. So if you're not very good East German students. Um, so this is the main building. If you look to the right, uh, this is the view down the street. So they've set it all up for a big parade uh, to celebrate. Uh, there you can see the Berlin Cathedral. To the right of the Berlin Cathedral is the Parliament Building of East Germany. And Mikhail, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, spoke there on this evening. I went to the church. Well, I, I, I went to both places, but I got to the church service in time. Uh, when we came out on the evening of October 7, uh, there were police standing everywhere, um, kind of keeping an eye on us. Um, we thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, we went back on the 8th, uh, and I'll show you some, talk about that a little more. But first, note these streets. It's a different structure than we have in this country. So uh, you could imagine if you put a row of policemen from the wall of the building across the sidewalk, across the street, and across to the next row, you could block this whole street off with a row of guys standing shoulder to shoulder. Uh, if you put them three deep, uh, it would hold pretty well. So on the 7th, there were just cops milling around. We heard later they arrested about 1,000 people, but I left before they started arresting people. On the 8th, when we came out of the church, uh, that's, this, row, this street was blocked off right here. The cops were standing about right there, three deep. And you look down the next street, you look down all four intersections, they're all blocked off. Uh, and then you think, wow, uh, the Eastern media has been talking about how well the Chinese solve problems. Chinese solutions are a really good idea. Um, I thought, hmm. So I got a little nervous. My friend and I, we went looking for a, a, a way out. And a, a guy who lived in the area said, well, if you go into a back courtyard, there's a wall that's about nine feet high. You can crawl over that, and then you can get out. So that's what we did on the evening of the 8th. Uh, that was a Sunday evening. Uh, on the way home, we saw a tank parked uh, in one of the side streets. Um, October 9th, the main date, I want you to remember October 9th was a Monday. Monday is the night of the big demonstrations in Leipzig. Now, so this is really the time when there's going to be a big showdown. Berlin's a kind of a small show. Leipzig is where thousands and thousands of people are going to show up. Would you go to this church service on October 9th? I said, I'm not going. Uh, my friend said, ah, oh, let's go. It's not going to be a big deal. So we went. I don't know. Do you have friends that talk you into stuff? We went. Um, when we got there, you know, they're always reporting uh, what has happened. So here's what we were told. You get into the church service, this is what we're told. Uh, parents have been ordered in Leipzig to pick up their kids from daycare and go home. All the factories, all the industry, everything is closed at 3 o'clock. Uh, somebody counted the number of army trucks bringing soldiers into Leipzig, 27 trucks full of army <coughs> soldiers. Uh, people who were Christian and connected to medical services, doctors or nurses, were reported that all the medical personnel in Leipzig were ordered to report for duty to the hospitals. Um, we're, we're starting to freak out a little bit. Uh, later, I found, what would you say if you were the pastor of that church? You had all these people. I don't remember what was said in our service, and there wasn't, uh, I haven't found a record of that. I can tell you that there were some guys in suits standing right in front of us. They stood like this the whole service. We'd say the Lord's Prayer, they'd stand like this. We'd sing Dona Nobis Pacham or some other well-known hymn, they'd stand like this. We're in their suits, never said a word. Like, well, okay, so they're there from the secret police. And training you how to fit in in a church service is not part of East German secret police training. <laughs> that We established that. Like, yep, they didn't get that memo. Um, I will tell you, there is a record of what was said in Leipzig at this time. Our church probably held, this church maybe held five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people out of a population of a million. That's not a big crowd. In Leipzig, 50,000 people showed up in four different churches. There is a record there of one of the sermons, or one of the meditations that was held, and it simply described what Martin Luther King Jr. did in this country. 
What do you do when you're faced with oppression? You pray and you march. How do we know that? Martin Luther King taught us. That was the sermon. At the end, a pastor simply said, For those who will remain in the city center, I wish to thank you for showing your desire for change, your desire to be treated as a human being. I would like to ask you once more for the strictest nonviolence. If we have a good goal, the path to our goal must be a good path, and the means we use must be good. Jesus taught us that, Dietrich Bonhoeffer taught us that, Martin Luther King taught us that. That lesson got all the way from here to Leipzig. When they got out, when we got out, uh, there was nothing. There were no cops. In Leipzig, they let them, 50,000 people all got out of the church service at once and started walking around the main inner ring. It's a demonstration. They're demonstrating for change and nobody's shooting them. What happened? Uh, for a long time, nobody knew, but there's just a new uh, article out uh, in German Studies Review that says, of all the ironic things, the Chinese sent a high-ranking delegation led by Yao Yiling, the deputy prime minister, uh, to this 40th anniversary celebration. Eric Honecker, the, the leader of East Germany, was meeting with that Chinese delegation when they were trying to call him and find out, do we shoot people or not? And he wouldn't take the call because he was with the Chinese. So the Chinese being in East Berlin uh, allowed this to go forward. Maybe maybe saved my life. I don't know. They would have started shooting later. I, uh, you know, we got out of there and, and uh, we just went home. So nothing happened on the 9th. But once you go out and demonstrate peacefully and nothing happens and people see that they can make a difference, more and more people joined. A month later, there were a million people on the street in East Berlin, about a half a mile from the wall. Now, what happens when a million people start to walk towards a border? This is like storming Area 51, right? The same, <laughs> right? That's the plan. What can they do? They can't shoot us all. <laughs> that was actually literally true. It's not possible. So what are they going to do? So the East German government thought of something else. Like, okay, we're going to have to re redo our visa uh, travel thing. And they said they announced on November 9, this is a, after October 9, we proved that we can out-demonstrate the government and the government is not going to be Chinese and shoot us. Now something has to give. On November 9, they said, okay, fine, we're going to let people apply for tourist visas, was their intent. They kind of left off that word tourist and they left off applied. They just say, we're going to change things. Uh, you can go, travel. They're not, they're not going to turn people down. Uh, and it's effective. Uh, people ask, well, so when is this effective? The guy just read the statement. Uh, and you didn't usually ask questions at communist press conferences. So they were loosening up, let you ask a question. Somebody asked, when is this effective? And he said, well, uh, I don't really know. Let's see, check my notes. I think it's effective immediately. He didn't know. It wasn't written down. He kind of made that up. People heard that. It's effective immediately. And they took off uh, and started pushing at different border posts. They said, we were told we can get out of here immediately. At one of them, about a 10-minute walk from my dorm, they actually got across. Uh, the border guard there was worried. This crowd is getting big and boisterous. He called. Nobody would tell him what to do. He just opened the door. He said, you guys go through. He figured he just kept a, stand he kept a record of everybody. He figured we'll arrest them when they come home because it's illegal to leave the country. Uh, but those people were interviewed on West Berlin TV, which everyone could receive in East Berlin. And so at 10.30 at night on November 9, Eckehart's knocking on my door. I went to bed already. I wasn't asleep yet. He's like, hey, Mark, get up. We're going to West Berlin. I thought, wow, those guys got really drunk. <laughs> and they didn't invite me. Because uh, this is not possible. The wall was a five-minute walk from my dorm, but you could never, ever cross it. Never, ever. Like I said, oh, we're going. He told me the whole story. I'm like, fine, let's go check it out. So I went to check it out. Uh, oh, here's the candles burning. This is like, this is November 9. <laughs> oh, I went to check it out. Uh, I'm going to shorten this story just a little bit. Um, so here's one of those East German cops. Uh, the first one we met told us, no, you can't really cross here. And we ran around a little bit. And we found, and it was like, uh, whatever. They, it was total chaos. Nobody knew what was going on. Uh, so we go out at 1030. It takes us till 2 o'clock figure out that they're actually letting us across uh, at the place where we wanted to go. 
so this is like uh, 2.30 in the morning, public transportation in West Berlin. So we got out, it was a five minute walk to a public transportation stop that was the border between East and West Berlin. Uh, so we just went through the border there, got on West Berlin, tra public transportation at 2.30 in the morning ordinarily doesn't run. But they had told the West Berlin mayor, a guy named Walter Mumpert, uh, that this was going to come someday and they should be planning for it. So the West Berlin officials knew, wow, when this happens, we better keep public transportation running all night. So they got that. So this was running. It was like 2.33 in the morning. You can see it's jammed full. They had to wait. They're like, get out of the door. We can't close it. Can't leave until you get out of the door. That door is still open. Too many people in it. So we all crammed in here. We go to downtown West Berlin. Uh, like, what do we do now? So Fetus is along and three other friends, Eckhart, uh, a couple other friends. What do we do now? Well, it's like obvious. Let's go visit Fetus's boyfriend. Remember him? <laughs> oh, well, we're going to go visit the boyfriend. Let's go visit the boyfriend. Um, like, great. So we, go to, the, we go, to the, go to the train stop there. We get on a night bus. They're not really running very well. There's not much ser bus service. We get as close as we can. We're still like a mile and a half away from where he lives. I'm like, what do we do? It's like four in the morning. What do we do now? So my East German friends just run up to a taxi driver and tell him, I mean, you saw this. The city is nuts. It's, everybody is up all night. So my East, my East German friends run to a taxi driver, tell him the problem. There's five of us. He crams us all into a taxi. That's not legal. Uh, I keep my mouth shut so he can't tell that I have West money. East Germans have no money that they can pay anything in West Berlin. So people are just buying them beer or whatever. They're all traveling for free and illegal. This taxi driver piles five of us in his taxi, drives us to, the, to Olaf's front door, drops us off at four in the morning. He doesn't ask for any money. We go wake up Olaf. He makes us breakfast. So November 9 is what the videos, that's what you're going to see. November 9, I mean, we weren't dancing on the wall. Lots of other people were. This is what you're going to see, November 9. The wall opens. People are happy. That is true. It's really a joyful time. How did we get there? Was it the $22 trillion we spent on Cold War defense spending? Or was it people out demonstrating peacefully? for their human rights? It's a complicated question. I just want you to think about that. But remember October 9, whenever you think about November 9. I'm going to leave it there. I think we have a little time for questions. We're waiting for the electronic form, but questions from the audience while we wait. So what happened to the, with these two? Ah, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's not a Disney movie. So <laughs> they, they were together for a while, uh, didn't last. Then she married another guy, that didn't last. Now she's married to another guy. She has a girl. Uh, you know, her life has moved on. Um, and she's now uh, a pastor in West Berlin. Um, and I, ho I hope to see her in January when I take, uh, taking an interview in interterm group to, January, in, to Berlin in January. I have, still have a lot of friends. I got more friends to see in Berlin than I have time during interterm, so we'll see. But so she had, you know, she had a yeah, not a happy ending for the two of them, but in general, she had a happy ending, a life of a lot more opportunities than she would have had uh, in a communist country as a theology student. Hey, Mark. Thanks for speaking today. Uh, I was just wondering, like, 
were you nervous at all at your with your time spent in East Berlin? Like, that feels like a pretty stressful situation to be there for three years with all this going on. Yeah, so I was I was super nervous the first couple of months uh, because I grew up here and we learned how evil communists are. Mm -hmm. And then I went over there and I'm like, now what? You know, like what is going to happen to me? What are they going to do? Uh, and I didn't know a soul. I did not know a single person. Uh, but I spoke fluent German. So language was not an issue. Uh, but figuring out that society was really complicated. And I had... Uh, some people who, who didn't know me at all and just assumed that I was truthful and not working for the CIA, and they just took me aside and said, look, here's how you deal with secret police. Never, ever say anything that you don't mean. You can't be flippant, which would be hard in our culture. We're very flippant about things. Oh, you know, whatever. So never say anything bad about the government unless you really mean it and you're willing you know, to stand up for it. So be conscious of what you're saying, and then don't worry about it. And if, uh, another really good piece of advice that I never had to follow was if the secret police uh, take you in for interrogations, they'll make you sign a, doc, a protocol of the interrogation, and they'll tell you, and, the, and that contract will require you not to talk to anyone about it because they want a cone of silence over their human rights abuses. And at that point, you say, well, my religion requires me you know, to talk to a pastor. Uh, I have a, a pastor lay sort of relationship and so I will be talking to a pastor I didn't know any pastor but you know the idea I would find one right so I'd, I'd say yes I'm actually you have to push back in a way that's legally allowed no I'm not going to respect your contract I'm going to talk to someone about what you did to me that was comforting to know that people have thought about this and then I got to know friends I actually almost never met a real communist uh, most people in the country despise the government uh, and we're very sympathetic. And then, of course, I was very nervous on October 8 and October 9. Uh, but I was with friends, and they said, ah, it'll be okay. And it was. Yeah, it was, it was intense. Thanks. We have a question from the electronic one. It says, what do you miss most about Germany? Ah, well, yeah. So what I miss about Germany is mostly my friends. Uh, I have family there, too. Uh, my mother was German, so um, I miss the people. Uh, I love the food. I love the culture. Um, I just, yeah. Uh, for my soccer friends, I'd sh say I'd really miss FC Union. They're awesome. Uh, they're not doing that great right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, German culture is awesome. I really, I really love it. I don't miss East Germany and the oppression. So I told one of my friends who was along, uh, the, another woman, Angelica, I said, oh, what are you doing to celebrate the 70th birthday of East Germany? She couldn't even figure out what I was talking about. When I finally explained it, she's like, we, you know, don't even bring up those memories. So you know, we're all glad that country's gone. We're not going to celebrate its 70th birthday or any birthday ever again. That's a good thing. Oh, thanks for talking today, Mark. Uh, so I had a question. Uh, so the protests of Hong Kong have been doing this for about four months now pretty mm -hmm. peacefully. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so you know uh, the people running the show for the Chinese in Hong Kong are the same people who did this to Tiananmen Square. Um, and Hong Kong has been working at this for a long time. Sometimes they let the demonstrations run out of steam and then they pick up again. Uh, what's going to happen? I have no idea. Uh, but I think what is inevitable is that the demonstrators will win human rights or this Chinese government will imprison them or massacre them. Um, and so, you know, it's an opportunity for people to say, well, gosh, what's going on in Hong Kong? I don't know. What can we do to support them? I don't know. Um, but there were a lot of reform efforts in the Soviet Union and elsewhere in communist countries that made this peaceful resolution possible. The Soviet tanks did not roll. Uh, I don't see any of that happening in China, so I'm, I'm frankly pretty pessimistic. Uh, but who knows? Because freedom can break out, you know, at any time. Um, and they are actually, one of their uh, slogans, or one of their songs that they sing is a, is a, a spiritual, a, a gospel hymn or something. I can't remember the name of it. 
uh, but churches are involved with Hong Kong uh, and providing some of the theme music uh, for that protest movement, which I think is fascinating. So who knows what will happen? I'm not very optimistic. One more question. Other than the one brand of food, what were some other notable cultural differences? Just say it again, please. Other than the one brand of food, what were some other notable cultural differences? Here we go. You notice anything about this row of cars? No, you don't say anything about that row of cars? There were two cars made in all of East Germany. Two cars. Two. You get a Trabi. Uh, somewhere I got the other one. Where's the other one? Uh, click back away. Or uh, where's the Vodford? Here's the Vodford. Two cars. What kind of car you want to buy? A Trabi or a Vodford? Two cars. That's it. Uh, the Trabi, I got to tell you, I love that little Trabi, this little thing. 26 horsepower motor, two-stroke engine. 26 horsepower is what your, what your riding lawnmower has. A two-stroke <laughs> engine means you have to mix the oil and the gas. They made this car uh, from the early 1950s all the way through 1989. Made the same car for 40 years. So, yeah, it's in the cars, it's everywhere. I mean, it's just, it was an utterly unique culture. Um, yeah, great stuff. One more round of applause for Dr. Mark Jansen.